So we're here with Enoch Wanderema. Enoch, could you just start by telling us something about yourself and, and about your career to date? Uh, yes, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm Enoch Wanderema. I come from Uganda, to be particular. The eastern side, most people understand uh, Mount Elgon is the biggest physical feature there. We neighbor Kenya. Uh, yeah, so we also have our other key in our tribe, which is Gishu neighbors Kenya, and we have other Gishu the other side. But uh, of that, I'm currently based in Kampala, uh, where I work as a journalist or a writer. I started writing from my campus. I was doing a, a bachelor's in mass communication at a university in, in Kampala, which is Uganda Christian University. And that's where I picked my interest in writing. At first, I didn't know even journalism existed, because when you're studying in Uganda from high school, uh, journalism is not that big of a thing. So then when I reached university, I realized uh, I applied for two courses, uh, education and mass communication. Uh, but mass communication wasn't really a thing I did because I just put it there as a second choice. But it turned out they gave me mass communication, I think. And I really didn't want to disturb them. I said, okay, let me go with this. But then it turns out it was perfect for me because I had passion for writing. Even in high school, I was doing literature. Uh, as a kid, they loved reading. So uh, it turned out to be the perfect thing for me. And when I started writing, I think uh, most people see writing as hard, really it's hectic, I'd say. Yeah, to some extent, I saw it as it's hectic. But when you have passion for it, yeah, 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 it becomes part and parcel of you. And I think the more I started reading, the more I studied, the more I started interacting with uh, writers, it became apparent for me that I'm a, <laughs> I'm born a writer and that's how I'm in journalism now. And did you start writing much younger or was that something you started at, at university then? Uh, much younger, yeah, I, I, uh, but I wasn't writing news. I was writing poems, I was writing, uh, trying to craft short stories, trying to maybe write song lyrics for people who'd want to, to, to sing. That was it. It wasn't more journalistic in a way. It was more literal doing literature because I was doing literature and reading many novels then and also uh, watching lots of movies, uh, hoping I'd write scripts for people. So that was the kind of writing I was doing. Then when I came to university, that's when journalism came in. So I leveraged my writing uh, ability and maybe had just to switch it to a journalistic uh, uh, avenue. You've been a journalist now for, for a, a little while. W what are some of the highlights of your job so far? Yeah, I'd say uh, I remember the first time, <laughs> my first writing journalistic was at campus. So I was writing for a university um, newspaper. So the very first time they told us to write a story. Before even for the, uh, before even we go to the news uh, the newspaper for the university uh, in class when they told us to write a very first story the task was hard for me because the thing is how are you going to interview people how are you going to to to, to convince them to say something the approach and you know you've never done this but it's a task and you know marks at the end of the day you want marks so to be honest uh, <laughs> I saw very many people. Because it's class, I saw very many people uh, forging uh, actualities. Obviously, we were around 100 at something. So the, uh, the lecturer wouldn't go asking everyone whether it's really, or maybe fact check whether it was said. Plus, uh, it was within university. But I learned something. Uh, luckily, I did not forge actualities. I just asked a few of my friends. Because uh, it was coursework, I needn't be, uh, I needn't uh it needn't be an, uh, 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 a case for me to go ask strangers. I just asked my friends, and that's how I got my actualities and put them in. But I learned something. Journalism is really something that needs courage, passion. Because if 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 you don't, you will you you will fail from the get go. You you will fail from the start. You know, because you have to be aggressive. Actually, you have to go in for it. It's more like. Uh, leaving your comfort zone because you have to meet strangers you have to ask questions and you and not just ask for asking sake but you have to get responses at the end of the day because that's the story yeah that's what i learned and when my friends even my friends were hard but then i had to get a response so i because <laughs> no one wanted to be on record but yeah i, I got that and it helped me when i uh, when i started i think uh writing for the university newspaper and i remember uh our supervisor saying, well, this is good. Uh, uh, it was a story about a friend because it was actually coursework, but we had to profile each other. So we were, 
we were coupled. And then um, the other one had to profile me and I had to profile her. Uh, at first, I really wrote nothing. Uh, okay, not nothing, but something. But to me, it, it it turned out to be nothing when my lecturer marked and said, you know, this is not how we write. I got demoralized to the extent that uh, I thought writing is not my thing. But because I had passion, I went back and asked the lecturer. So I know I, I, know I have failed, but how do I improve? Because I want this and I want max. Uh, she told me it's okay. Uh, she 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 took me through uh, a few tricks here and there, and then yeah, I I I think I wrote my second piece of that very profile, and I got <laughs> a little bit more marks, not not those I wanted, but yeah, a, a bit higher. They can help me pass that uh, feature writing or maybe profile writing. Uh, good, uh, luckily enough, the university liked it and they published it on their partners' websites. Uh, it, it, it felt good for me when it was published. I was like, okay, so you can even get published and seeing your byline somewhere by Enoch and the Roma. I was like, yeah, that's perfect. And getting my first byline, uh, you not know, being on the internet somewhere when someone can type in Enoch and the Roma and they see your byline, you've written this. It felt cool for me. And I think that was the the, the, the turning point for me start writing more and 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 looking for more opportunities and uh what have been some of the worst experiences the worst experiences i think <laughs> i said because it's it's passion for me i rarely see worst experiences because when it was worst, i say i go with it because i expect such but i'd say um the biggest challenge is uh getting sources especially when you're writing for an international newspaper uh, like news decoder that's not popular in Uganda, so you 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 have to introduce yourself and you have to 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 explain what news decoder is, what it does, where it's from, and then uh, get people to 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 respond to your questions. But it's 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 always hard because in Uganda media is 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 not Uganda. I think most countries people don't trust that much the media. They ever getting conscious of what they say. Uh, to the media and i think uh, that's the challenge convincing people getting actualities getting someone to to uh, uh, to respond to your questions but more so convincing them that you're writing for an international newspaper maybe news site and then you have to explain everything in there otherwise it's 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 something that never changes journalism is the same uh worst experiences i don't know whether you've ever had any bad one uh, like, uh I, maybe i remember the first <laughs> It's not much at campus. I was writing for the news for our campus newspaper. I wrote a story about our guild parliament uh, because it was a case where the guild president or maybe the guild government had to be given 30 million Uganda shillings for a guild trip. But the guild president had proposed instead of using that money on the guild government for just a trip, luxury and uh, enjoying, they'd rather spend that money and give uh, students who are needy. So, um, the parliament was not in agreement. So I went to ask the parliament. Uh, because it was heat of passion, actually, they were debating and it was, <laughs> they were passionate about it. I asked them, I think it was quick to get responses. So they responded without thinking twice. And I recorded that. And then when I went to the to the to the <laughs> to the president, he gave me his version. So I wrote the story. It was published. Now you know when it was published because very many students read it. And the thing is, no student would uh, support uh, such money going to the good government just for a trip, okay? And a trip that is not beneficial to the campus, or maybe it's not even official. Uh, uh, I won't say it's official because it's official. It's their mandate. They have to go, but it's just enjoyment, entertainment. They are not really doing much. So I'm sure students would, would be supportive of the president because he was rooting for them, using the money to support the needy students who were maybe lacking tuition and stuff. So when the story was published, the uh, government was, or maybe the parliament was criticized and they started coming back to me. They're like, man, we have to take you to the uh, students' tribunal. You have to explain why. <laughs> yeah, uh, I was scared because it was my first time writing such a story. And they're not taking me to the students' tribunal as also something I'd never heard of. Like, I didn't, I never expected I'd be there at any point. So they threatened, that, uh, they threatened me, but then the editors said, 
but they said it and it's on record. So if anyone wants to take you, let them come to the university uh, media and uh, say we lied. If we lied, good, they will take you. But if we didn't, actually they will have to be penalized for trying to threaten you. So just go out, be safe. Don't, don't even bother. They won't do anything to you. And luckily enough, they were just threatening because really they said the words and I think they just felt uh, ashamed because it turned against them. Yeah, uh, but nothing worse than that has ever happened to me, really. <laughs> uh, Enoch, I, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about one of the stories that you'd written for us. Um, recently, you wrote Making Sense of Wild Creatures with Photography. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell us a little bit about that article? Could you, in a sentence or two, break it down for us? Uh, so um, I got interested in the story uh, because... Uh, I wrote a story from, uh, I think it's Monga Bay, it's also a wildlife or maybe environment site that publishes such stories. So the story was about a camera, a camera trapping that, um, but their angle was interesting. It was about the safety and privacy. When I wrote it, I thought, do we have such in Uganda? And luckily enough, uh, our Ugandan parks are just starting to use such technology. And also, uh, when I contacted one of my my sources, which is also another trick that people have to get when you do a story with someone, uh, keep them keep them in contact. Because I remember doing a story back then last year in September, I think it was still in March uh, Manson Falls. It was about the Rangers. Yeah, it was still published in the news decoder. And they kept their contacts. It was easier for me to contact them and ask them, do you use this technology? Do you have, is, is there anything new? Luckily enough, they were using the technology and uh, it had also spotted a, 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 an endangered species. That's a pangolin. And to me, I was like, okay, now that they are using it, uh, what's interesting about it? And that's how I started uh, talking to them. Uh, got what's interesting about it and uh, how it could also help Ugandans or maybe uh, how it could help uh, the tourism industry in Uganda, but also be of uh, a, a benchmarking support to anyone or maybe any country or any uh, uh, people who are working in wildlife. The topic revolves around camera traps and you mentioned privacy there. So mm -hmm. can you tell us a bit about who's affected by those issues and and people or or wildlife who's who's affected uh, very many uh, uh, sorry very many people are affected because uh, most people may look at it as something that's affecting wildlife but uh, we are in this ecosystem biodiversity and we figured uh, maybe uh, the numbers in Ugandan wildlife are, are, are declining the animals are declining maybe due to um, uh, to the conflict between the communities surrounding the parks and uh, the predators in the parks that go to encroach on their livestock, uh, which is also another bad thing. So in 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 in, <laughs> in retaliation, they have to kill them, uh, and then poaching. So if that happens, it means uh, the tourism industry will also uh, uh, be affected. And the tourism industry is broad. It's not just Uganda, and it's not just uh, the community surrounding, but everyone who is interested in, uh, in 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 touring or maybe coming anywhere or maybe seeing these these animals. But also the revenue that comes from it. Uh, 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 when 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 wildlife or maybe these species decline, it's 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 uh, it's it's a dent in the in the in, in the government financials. So um. It's it's it it affects when you look at it in a bigger perspective. Everyone was not just everyone, but then um, when we go to privacy, it's more of the people surrounding the community. Uh, sorry, the the parks, the community surrounding the parks, because most of them go in the parks for uh, to fetch firewood or maybe to to, to cut grass to thatch their houses. Um, very many activities grazing in there. But then um, if these are used and 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 maybe they're doing something and then uh, uh, they, will, they will stop you uh, doing such activities because they know there are cameras in there, it's a limit. But uh, when I asked to think about that, they said uh, it's a protected area. So really people should know anything can happen in a protected area. 
And if you know it's a protected area, then you shouldn't do anything that's uh that <laughs> that shouldn't be recorded in there. Because because you know it's protected and there is cameras in there. Uh, but um I think this technology is is is, is just nascent, it's, it's, it's only it's nascent stages. It started way back, but people using it for research and all that. Most countries maybe or maybe it's been done but on the low. So I think most people outside there, it, 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 it would sound more of a um, benchmarking article where people look at it and, and the question uh, what uh, 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 conservation uh, strategies are being done in our countries. You know, um, is there anything happening to our spaces? Is, is, is our tourism being affected? Um, and and if so, what measures are being done to bring back or maybe to revamp uh, wildlife, this biodiversity, and 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 so if if there are measures, then you interrogate the measures. Are they safe for the people? In this case, these are cameras. Are they safe? Are they being used ethically? And that's where the previous bit came in. Because if you're not using the, that that uh, kind of technology, or maybe you're, uh, you're using another, there could be other concerns. Okay. So you should interrogate um, what concerns come with such technology or such measures. And, and that's what the story is trying to look uh, at. Uh, what measures and also interrogating the measures are they safe for the people in there? And did you find there were any measures that are kind of helping to better the issue? What kind of things can they do or what kind of things are they doing? Well, uh, since it's a protected area, I think uh, people shouldn't really do anything illegal in there. But if they do, then uh, uh, the only measure that I saw that's being taken to 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 <laughs> is when people graze and then maybe the the, the predators in the park uh, attack their animals. There is this compensation scheme that people do. I think uh, the, that the park does. I think they collect money from entrances in the park, and twenty percent of that is to compensate uh, the communities around. But also, um, the park also has another uh, partnership with a certain organization that uh, that is uh, mandated with compensating people if they lose their livestock. Otherwise, there is nothing we can do about privacy because it's a protected area and you can't fight the law. And in terms of conservation in the area, um, what can students do to help fight the problems that are there? Well, uh, as 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 I said uh, earlier, I think it's it's more of benchmarking, and students just have to interrogate and 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 maybe write more. It's more of a public, uh, or maybe creating awareness because a tourism tourism is more of people coming in, and 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 when people come in, it's more revenue to the government. So if it's Ugandan students specifically, uh, whatever they do, creating awareness for the wildlife, it boosts the country's revenue through tourism. But for others who are outside Uganda, it's more of benchmarking what is happening in your country. In conservation, what's happening in your country? And then um, if you find what's happening, is it safe for everyone? Or is it only uh, benefiting the government? Such are the things you have to interrogate. So it's, it's, it's more of balancing everything that's being done for conservation to benefit both the government, uh, to benefit the people, but also uh, to boost uh, wildlife, to make sure uh, it's not declining, because you now we have very many issues. We just came from the pandemic, which also affected tourism. We, uh, we are also suffering from uh, global climate, so maybe, uh, maybe climate change, uh, global warming and all that. So, yeah, it's more of interrogating and creating awareness of the importance of wildlife, but also uh, the importance of balancing the measures that are taken to revamp wildlife to benefit both parties, the people and the government, but also uh, to make sure it is it's safe for um, uh, wildlife, because you know wildlife is, 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 is sensitive to technology, if you know. So anything that has to be done should be really uh, considerate to, to, to biodiversity. With this story, what did you learn while writing or researching this piece? The first thing I learned is uh, when you're writing a story, especially uh, these feature stories, uh, uh, give it time, don't rush. Understand what you want. Actually, before you even go for interviews, do your research. 
know what you want, know the end goal, what do you want? Because features are not hard news. You're not rushing, you're not on a deadline that maybe you have to publish this by evening. Uh, you have to publish this event by evening. You have to talk to the president and report back to the editor. You're being given time. And I think with a news decoder, it's more featuristic. Yeah, You're not writing um, such hard news that's in a hurry. So invest, uh, invest in the preparation. I remember someone told me uh, a phrase. I don't know whether it's, uh, <laughs> I don't know whether it's, it's the perfect uh, statement he said, but he said that uh, when you're given six hours to cut down a tree, uh, use the first four to sharpen the axe, and then the last two to cut it down. So invest more time in invest more time in uh, preparation. Do your research. Understand what's needed, why it's needed, and why it's important to the story. And then that's where you'll get a good gist of the questions that you have to ask and really who you need to ask because you've invested in time. And then uh, when you do that, I think uh, writing it would be easy because you have all the information. You have what you want. You know what you needed for what reason. And then, um, and I think it's also easier for you to convince people uh, for interviews because you've done your research and you know who you want to interview. Uh, you know what you want. So when someone asks, why do you want me? Because I remember one time someone asked me, why me? You know, so uh, if you hadn't done the research, it would be hard for you to convince them. But when someone asks why me, uh, <laughs> I'll give you a story. It was my lecturer, actually, because I was interviewing her during my intern at a certain radio in Kampala. And uh, it was more of a feministic idea. And I know she's, um, she doesn't know by, uh, she doesn't go by issues of gender equality. So I was asking her a question about gender equality. And she said, why me? She said, I'm not a, um, I'm, I'm, I'm gender, is it, I don't know, gender blind or something. So I, I, I don't need to, to answer to your questions. But I said, actually, you're the perfect person because most people have uh, ideas about gender and they are biased. But since you're gender blind, your perspective would work for me because it's different. That means if I had been pre uh, precise, I'd have failed to convince her. And then after that, she said, okay, you've won. Let's have the interview. <laughs> you get uh, it. For yeah. this particular story, how did you find the people and, and the experts to help you tell the story? After my research, after knowing uh, I wanted to, to, it's wildlife, that's the general story. So I need people from, wild, uh, from wildlife. Uh, two, I'm going to interrogate about the technology. So I need technician who understand the technology. Three, um, it's going to be more ethical. I'm going to ask about privacy. So I will need someone who is not just working because some people who are just working on the low are uh, on the ground or maybe don't understand the ethics of things. They just follow orders. So I need someone who is uh, having a high rank in conservation because they understand the effects of privacy and the use of this technology. So you start uh, mapping your stakeholders. In, let me just call them stakeholders in this area. So you start mapping, if I get someone on the ground who's using the technology, uh, what would they be interested in answering or what's their work life like? So for them, people on the ground don't understand anything about uh, ethics, they're just working. So their issue would be, is the technology taking their job or is it helping them enhance their job? So that would be their question. So it's not more of privacy. And then, um, when you go, when you uh, when you climb up the ladder, that's when you start asking, why did you start uh, using this tech? Because those are the people who understand, who make the policies, who come up with ideas. That's when you also ask about uh, privacy. But this is done before you even go to the people. But now this is just mapping, because the idea you're researching and you know who you want and what you're going to ask. When you get this whole body of ideas and who, why, and then you start mapping out or maybe looking for people. You start sourcing. As I told you, always keep contacts as a journalist. I remember the person I had asked, uh, I had interviewed who gave me her contacts on that last year's uh, uh, Rangers story. I texted her on LinkedIn. I was like, hi, um, this is it. I'm interested in this story. And uh, do, do you use this technology? Obviously, I knew they used it, but I just wanted to get it from her. And she said, yeah, we do. And actually, we, we, we found this and this and this. I'm like, okay, I'm interested. Uh, do you think we can have an interview or maybe connect me to someone who can tell me this and this and this? 
she was like, okay, uh, good enough. She was a partnerships person. So it was easier for her to get me someone of a high rank and then people on the ground. So she got me a team of people on the ground and someone of a high rank to answer the hard questions because I told her what I wanted and the kind of people I wanted. And then it was easier for me to, to, to get them. And that's how we went about the story. But if I hadn't had the uh, if I hadn't kept the, the, the contact previous, it would be hard for me too. That's why I'm always emphasizing keep contacts. You never know when you need that person again. Uh, but then if it's hard, if you don't have contacts, the internet is here. I have done very many stories, just called emailing or called texting someone on LinkedIn and like, hey, um, this is so-and-so. I'm working for News Decoder. Uh, I'm writing a story about this and this and this, and I figured you could be a good source for it because your, your LinkedIn profile shows this and this and this. Uh, do you think you'd be interested? And then they, maybe they'll start asking you, uh, what's in it for me? And you told them, it's a story. Uh, we are not paying money for you to be in. You're just doing it voluntarily, <laughs> you know? But at the end of the day, these people want. They just want you to convince them with self for them to. Yeah, so it's a digital world. You can't say I don't have sources, really. Just go on the internet. I've done very many stories just call texting someone on, on LinkedIn or maybe uh, calling someone who knows someone who knows someone. There is this theory I learned called um, the six degrees of separation where, 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 where it is stated that you can talk to anyone in the world anywhere within a link of six people. Okay. So you can talk to Obama within just a link of six people. <laughs> I don't know how possible that is, but... Obviously, I've not uh, I've not yet reached the level of interviewing Obama or Biden or maybe Putin, but I think uh, anyone I've always wanted to ask or interview, I've been successful ninety times percent because it's just knowing someone who knows someone who knows someone. Then you ask, hey, do you think I can get someone's contact? Uh, they say, ah, I don't have it, but I think I can give you someone who knows that person. So you do it like that. But if you can't. Trying to search them on uh, on the net. Maybe they have socials. Maybe they have Twitter and their inbox is open. Maybe they're on LinkedIn and their inbox is open. Or maybe you can somehow find their email. Or maybe you may not find that exact person, but you might find someone who can give you that very information, someone else. Because you searched on the internet and you didn't find that person, but the internet is good enough these days that it can recommend for you someone else. And generally people are, if you show interest in them and you show that you're you're honest and fair, yeah, uh, generally people are open to, to talking to you. What's the toughest part of writing or reporting a story then? The toughest part is 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 failing the first draft because you have to write everything and then you have to send it to the editors. You know, editors, <laughs> now you're worried whether they are going to tell you, please, this is lacking. You have to go back and source this. But luckily enough, that hasn't happened that much to me, I think, because uh, as I told you, preparation is key. If you... if if you do your research enough and map out all areas that are needed, I think editors wouldn't send you back for more interviews. But the toughest part is, yeah, failing in the first draft or maybe submitting it and waiting on the responses from the editors. It's really tough, but it's uh, it's also satisfying because at least you know you have a pair of eyes, someone. Because at the end of the day, editors are improving your story. They are not making it worse. So that's the satisfaction that in as much as Someone might bring it back for you to repeat everything afresh or maybe <laughs> they are making it better. They are not making it worse. And at the end of the day, it's you who is benefiting, really. And Enoch, if you had one tip to give to budding journalists, what would that one tip be? I don't know whether it's one. And I think I've been <laughs> I've been saying this in this conversation. I've been saying uh, preparation is key. Okay. Spend more time on preparation and your uh, and your story will be successful. Two, in every story, there is a character. Have a character in your story. Let the story run along that character. I think I learned this from uh, uh, a news decoder correspondent as well, because she's my mentor, Helen Womack. Uh, she's really helped me uh, improve on my writing. Um, she's always told me, have a character in your story, run by that character. So uh, when you look at the, 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 the story that I published with News Decoder about for God's Kings and Nescav, it had me as a character. So it was following me. It was my personal perspective and my experience. 
So anything I was saying was coming from my perspective. And when you get that character, because characters are humans, you're trying to make the story relatable to anyone because you're giving that person's experience. And so anyone who's reading will be uh, will relate to the story because it's happening to a fellow human being. You get it? Uh, when you look at the story, I wrote about uh, Rangers, also published by the News Decoder. I think the title is uh, A Race to Save Ugandan, uh, Uganda's Hippos. So uh, the character was Raymond, a ranger who we were running with for 21 kilometers. So he was getting a story from his perspective. What does it mean to be a ranger? What does this experience mean? Because And because they are laden with 22 kilograms of uh, beans in their back sacks, you know, and you're running 21 kilometers and that's your character you're following, the story will be relatable to anyone because you, you'd put yourself in that person's shoes. The same, the same that came here to, to this very story about camera trapping, the characters in there, they are talking about... Um, what it means to use the uh, the technology is is uh, would they be afraid because that uh, would they be afraid that the technology will take away their jobs because it's AI and it's doing most of the job most of the tracking is it is it in any way helping uh, so when you get the actualities you're getting such people to talk you're getting people to talk uh, the other tip that would maybe add on that is um, a story is made up of actualities it's made up of interviewing people. So you can't have a good story without interviewing people. Obviously, we have opinions. That's good. Opinions are also that uh, you may not interview people because it's your opinion. But if you're writing a good story, let's say about a certain topic, a feature or hard news, interviews are key. Interview people. You'll be surprised what they say and your story will be perfect. Uh, the other thing is um, never assume you're the best writer in the world. Yeah, no one is a good writer or the best writer. There is always someone to look at the story. So when you finish writing, ask someone to look at it. Uh, maybe a second pair of eyes will help you. Uh, but if you don't have someone else to look at it, obviously you have editors. Every good writer has an editor. That's what Helen Omar always tells me. Every good writer has an uh, editor somewhere. So never assume you've written perfectly. Always know you've written, you've done your part, but if but uh, you have to put it to the editor or maybe say, uh, another pair of eyes to check through and see. I don't know, but uh, some of us will have our own way of seeing things. So that's the way you write your story. But you might find it that uh, the way you've written it is hard to comprehend when someone else reads it. So when you give it to a second person to see, they'd say, I don't understand this. But to you, it's understandable because you've written it and that's how you want it to be written. But when a second uh, a pair of eyes sees it, like, but this is, this is hard to understand. What did you mean by this? So you'll figure out, or oh, maybe you need to turn down on the English, or maybe you need to simplify it, or maybe you need to rephrase it. And I think that happens a lot to my stories. Uh, most editors say, oh, please, uh, would you would you kindly rephrase this for us to understand it a little bit clearer, or maybe for anyone who is reading not to go to the dictionary to look for what you're saying, but to understand it straight away. Yeah, so I think I think that's that would be it. But uh, also be passionate. Journalism is not something that's that's just for swag and having bylines and being searched on Google. You you're not doing it for money. You're not doing it for 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 maybe um, the sake of being a journalist and associating with bylines. Be passionate about it, because trust me, you might write stories and they are. <laughs> They are not published, but you've invested a lot of uh, energy in it and time. But that shouldn't stop you. Because uh, uh, if you're passionate, you'd understand why it's not been published or why it's not been taken on. And so you just aim higher to make sure you impress the editors, because obviously they're the gatekeepers. Without them, you, your story is not published. So have passion, prepare, and um, uh, have passion for journalism. Prepare, invest in preparation, make sure your story is seen by other people before it's published. Have a second pair of eyes to read through your story. And uh, a good story is about people, interviews. Make sure your story has voices. Mm, that's what I would say for now. You mentioned that piece of God's King's uh, Nescafe. Can you mm -hmm. give me a little bit about what that piece is about? So uh, put it simply, that piece is about um, a rural uh, 
a rural uh, tradition, uh, let me say a uh, traditionist or maybe a rural tribal person like me in an urban setting. Because when you look at the urban setting, it's more of uh, 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 attracting uh, global audiences. But then you're coming from this rural setting where it's different values and different traditions and uh, different customs or maybe even cultural practices or traditional practices for, uh, in our case, circumcision, which is more traditional than this safe male circumcision. But, and then uh, your, uh, that my very background is also, um, it's African and, and these are people who believe a man is more superior than a woman and all that. But so coming with all those values and you're going to work with people in, in an urban setting where people have different beliefs, for example, gender equality, uh, uh, people uh, 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 don't believe in traditional circumcision, they feel it's unsafe, but this is where you're coming from. And uh, 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 such life is, 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 is the balance between being um, a tribal person in an urban setting. Can you tell us a little bit about what that shift was like for you, moving to Kampala and moving to the urban setting? Personally, how, how was that? The shift, um, I would say it wasn't hard for me because... I think uh, <laughs> thanks to education, I think when you go to school, uh, you're exposed to very many things. But uh, I put myself in the shoes of a person or maybe someone who didn't go to school, because those would be staunch traditionists. They, uh, they, they know nothing about gender equality. They know nothing about um, self-male uh, self circumcision. They know nothing about um, uh, the way people react in a professional way or maybe uh, uh, act in a professional way. So they're coming straight from the village or maybe a remote area and they're coming to Kampala where you're going to meet very many people from different parts of the world and they act differently. And so such a person would find it very, very hard to, 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 to cope with the environment because this seems like it's, it has a fast pace. An urban setting has a fast pace because everything is happening in a different way and everyone seems to know what they are doing and you're here, you're from a different background where everything is calm, you have your own traditions, you have your own way of doing things. So that would be hard. Uh, so uh, that story, what uh, uh, what it was trying to, to, to do is um, how people should reflect on being uh, global citizens, really. Because at the end of the day, we, we, we should appreciate that the world, uh, we are not the only ones in the world. And the world is changing because of this crisis we are having, global warming, the pandemic, very many things are changing. And so it was more of trying to tell people we need to shift, really. And more so the young people who, 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 who are comfortable uh, wherever they are. They, are, they have not been exposed or they have not traveled enough. It's a wake up call for people to understand the world is complex and we should we should be aware of different kinds of people everywhere and 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 we should cope up because it's no longer a remote world. It's it's it's, it's connected, interconnected. Yeah. And you you finished it by talking about coffee. Uh, yeah. What was that about? You said in the end, it, it all boils down to coffee. What were the themes that you were getting out of, of that? So um, in my tribe, we have uh, very many traditions, but two that stand out is uh, male circumcision, the traditional one, and then um, coffee. Okay. So uh, uh, the, way we <laughs> the way we make coffee has also shifted. Just like circumcision has shifted, uh, uh, has shifted to safe male circumcision, so coffee has also shifted. Uh, that is because uh, for us we grow coffee, the Arabica coffee, we harvest it, and there is a traditional way we 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 make the coffee or we brew the coffee. But then, the the the, the world or maybe the urban world has brought us to instant coffee, the likes of Nescafe. So. The traditional way we used to make coffee is uh, you harvest it, you, 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 you wash it, you wash it of the slimy substance that's on it, and then you, you, you dry it. And then you roast it in the traditional way, and then you pound it in a wooden mortar. Okay, So that's a process. That's quite a process compared to just going to the shop and buying uh, Nescaf. That's, that's more instant. So, so the urban world has taught us to do instant things. And then uh, I think... <laughs> We, 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 it makes us lose our traditional values. 
And that's why I was saying, I think it's, it's maybe it comes down to, to, to coffee because the way my grandfather used to do it is not the way we do it now. And sometimes you miss the past or maybe you miss how it was being done traditional, which is more organic, but it's what it is, it's life. And I think in as much as we are switching to being global citizens and, and, and technology is bringing these instant things, it's also, it's also changing the way we live. And I think it's a wake up call to people. Um, how much do we have to, 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 to live out, to embrace the, 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 the new life? Uh, but also um, how much do we have to, 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 to retain? And, and how much do we have to stick to and say, no, we can't leave this. This is us, this identifies us. It's more about identity and uh, identity in a global world really in this global setting yeah Enoch um, thank you very much for talking to us today and uh, good luck with your journey ahead you're welcome it was a pleasure really